Yeah, whether it's good morning or good afternoon, whatever time it is, we are in the lessons for this coming week, and they're they're exciting and uh, I think immediately accessible. Uh, so I'm looking forward very much to sharing them with with you, Pastor Stephen, and and yeah. uh, with whoever is tuning in on the the lessons for the lectionary. Uh, <clears throat> where do you want to start? You want prayer? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lord, you are so good. We uh, thank you that you are with us uh, everywhere that we are, spread out as we are. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would work with, with your grace and your, your truth and your power as we hear your word, Lord, that you would do your good in each one of us. Um, Lord, strengthen our faith and equip us for, uh, for sharing your love in this world. Bless this time of reflection and learning. In Jesus, we pray. Amen. Yeah, as you, as you know, if, if you spend any time in the scriptures at all, the scriptures are just full of all different kinds of um, a literature, I guess we'd call them. There is uh, the kind of literature that is probably most accessible for us, and that's just um, the literal translations and literal interpretations of the word. But at the same time, uh, you know, we have the literal, and then there's that powerful kind of language that uh, it comes to us in the Psalms, which is a, a kind of uh, language all its own. It's poetry, um, and uh, there is such a range of, of uh, the kinds of feelings that the psalmist might have, uh, and they are prose and they are poetry. And then there is the kind of uh, language or literature or speech that we're going to spend some time in this morning, which is a uh, uh, probably in some respects the most fun and it's the most fun because it comes from the tongue of our Lord and obviously you already know what I'm talking about this morning we're going to do the parables or at least some of the parables in the 13th chapter of Matthew's gospel is really the introduction of uh, Jesus uh, words and his his life expressed and the kingdom of God expressed and the mission of God expressed in terms of parables and why this language and why our Lord Jesus Christ evidently loved to use this vehicle or this this proper means of speech uh, to touch the lives of the people and this morning we're going to see or this, today we're going to see crowds again around him. Um, any, any, uh, any thoughts uh, Pastor Stephen as we introduce this? Especially in, in the gospel, the books, the gospel books, it, it really is striking the different ways Jesus teaches. You know, there's times where he takes his disciples to different locations, and that location has a lot to say about the topic uh, of, of his particular lesson at the time. Sometimes the location is a, a part of the fulfillment of prophecy, you know, where the the Sermon on the Plain and or the, the feeding of the 5,000 and you see Psalm 23 fulfilled there. And, and, um, and then there's the parables and the other the metaphors that he uses to help us understand, to drive, drive truth, divine truth home to us who live in a world with animals around us where, you know, I'm a, I'm a desert dwelling city slicker, so I don't really get sheep so much, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I get dirt and I get rocks. And I, I, when the scripture talks of water in the desert and it blooming, that really comes, yeah, I get that. And so uh, all, all the ways that God has uh, packaged his truth, revealed who he is and what he has planned in ways that we in our diversity can understand, whether it's our age, whether it's our economic status, whether it's the region, the world from which we you know, have our norm in life, God's word communicates to us. And so these parables are awesome. Yeah, and you remind me, this, 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 it's still, in a sense, a brand new desert dweller. I've only lived here now for what uh, about about um, uh, oh, almost almost uh, twenty years mm -hmm. uh, between uh, my time in the mountains of New Mexico and now my my years here. But 
but you're exactly right that 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 our Lord uses whatever is around because all of it is creation of God and all of it is vehicle for God's word, as we're going to see in the first lesson. Well, we're talking about the parables in Matthew, and we obviously are going to stand up for these gospel lessons so you all can sit down, okay, because we're going to start in the, in the Old Testament, which is a language all its own, as we're reading this morning from Isaiah. Yeah. Um, and uh, Isaiah, it's in the 55th chapter of Isaiah, so it's well into the last parts of Isaiah. Uh, and as I read this this morning, um, uh, it's, it's again, uh, it's, it's picture language. It, it's not parable, and it's not really poetry, but uh, God gives his word to Isaiah, and Isaiah speaks this word in this marvelous 55th chapter. It is the chapter <laughs> every every pastor is it's a go-to pastor because it reminds us that our the God's word never, never returns to us empty. So if in the Sunday afternoon we go into a blue funk and we're a little bit uh, depressed because we should have done better, wanted to do better, and the Holy Spirit enabled us to do probably as, as much as we were able to this day, but listen to this. My word will never return unto me void. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. And um, it, it's not obviously only a word for pastors, but I kid about that because more than once I have relied upon this passage to give me new energy and also give me grace and forgiveness because God promises that even through the weakness of preaching, even through the weakness of our teaching, even through the weakness of our own little lives, God's word shall never return unto me empty. There is, you know, you remember words before this, and it's almost, I almost feel like we're cheating if we don't read the whole 55th chapter, which I'm not going to do. But there are those words, remember, where God says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Or these other words, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. Well, this is... The, what what Isaiah is given as he precedes these words, as the rain and the snow come down to heaven, from heaven, do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. Now, there is, is a kind of, what would you say, a, a kind of caveat there. It is not just because we speak or think we speak in the name of the Lord, but because we've done our, we've done our homework. We have spent time in the Word ourselves. And once again, I'm obviously not talking just about pastors or those who have a full-time calling. I'm talking about the way that God calls all of us into his word again and again. For there is in the way that we live in and grow out of Holy Scripture, that there is a kind, of, what would you call it, a kind of authority, a kind of wisdom, a kind of excitement, and all the ways that God's word through his Holy Spirit and his Holy Spirit through his word bring to us again in our lives something deeper, something richer, whether we know it or not, or whether we feel it or not. If we're living in and out of the Word, then, then our lives and our words have a kind of, how would you say it, an authority, uh, a kind of purpose in our lives, and a way that beyond ourselves, the words that we speak and the life that we live 
grows into and out of what is happening around us. And so we, we speak, once again, out of the biblical word. Yeah. Verse 12, verse 12. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. Now, this is no small word that those to whom he's speaking hears it, because they are those who are still in exile. They are those who are still longing for that time when they might go back to Judea, back to Jerusalem, back to the temple, and, and to begin to, uh, again, hear God's word and live out the meaning of God's word as Jews from all over, all over the Middle East are now freed to come back and to reestablish and to follow God's promise when he says, I'm going to call you from every corner of the world and you're going to come back and you are going to reestablish where I set my sights for a uh, an outreach to the entire world, namely, once again, Judea and Jerusalem and the Jerusalem temple. You are going to go out in joy and you are going to be led forth in peace, the mountains and the hills, before you shall break forth into singing. Now, what kind of language do you call that? That's got to be a little bit of poetry, a little bit of parable, a little bit of seeking to embrace whatever is around me at this point, and also a way to, to give uh, even to the inanimate objects like mountains and seas and so on, the privilege, the privilege of being part of the promise and the word of God. So, uh, <laughs> the mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Now, just a kind of a hint of where this is going. Again, this is going as the Old Testament lesson to open up the parable and the parables that Jesus is telling us and going to tell us this week and certainly against, again next week. So picture this, if you would, verse 13. The, the, and the exiles who have been in exile in Babylon for 70 years as a people group, and some of these people, like Zechariah that we heard from last week, was born in Babylon and now comes back to the, uh, the place of Judea. And this is what they find. This is not an easy easy trip back, nor is it a time of exaltation when they see what has happened to the hills of Judea, to the city of Jerusalem, and to a temple which is now absolutely destroyed. This is what they're going to see, but this, what they see with their eyes is going to now take a brand new shape once again. Verse 13, instead of the thorn but you're going to come back to. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, the beautiful cypress tree. Instead of the briar and the briar patch shall come up the myrtle tree and the beauty of it. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is, on the one hand, hard work, but it is hard work which is based upon the promise of God and is lifted up, whether it's Judea or whether it's now the little city of Jerusalem, which is once again beginning to grow up into the, the center of wisdom and theology and Christianity, whether it knows it or not. This is all because of the name of the Lord. It's going to be hard work, but you are going to see this grow again as an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> replacing the hurt, replacing the, the, the isolation. You know, they, they were ripped away from their homeland and uh, they're in exile and, you know, for God to give a promise that they can hold on to, that they can look forward to, of, you know, the images that he gives that you point out, you know, the, the cypress instead of the thorn, you know, the myrtle instead of the briar. 
we need that that encouragement constantly to remember that what we're experiencing now isn't what will be yeah. by, by the gift and the mercy and the power of God. Uh, we'll, we'll smile again. <laughs> well, and Christians have a special kind of responsibility not to be Pollyanna about what we're going through. Don't worry, because there are promises of God in this time, which would have been 700 years ago till about 520 years ago in that time frame. Um, that it, not simply the promises of yesterday, but the promises of God to us also again today. Not simply that there is hope on the other side, but that God's grace and God's promises will never let us go. Yeah. As the water, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth. That is power, promise of renewal, and I guess, once again, do not return there but water the earth. It's time to remember, Pastor Stephen, our baptism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, that, that life of hope, not having yet the, the outcome that is, is promised, but, uh, but living with that hope, knowing that it is coming. And uh, it's, it's a recurring theme, uh, you see it throughout the Bible. My, my mind often goes to Hebrews 11 and 12, where in Hebrews 11, it's by faith, and it you know, tells of an Old Testament figure who, uh, who had faith in God and, was, and heard the promises of God, but didn't see the, see the result in their lifetime. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, gets to the long list by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, and then beginning of 12. Uh, let us also, therefore, surrounded by their testimony, their witness, uh, uh, put aside the weight and the sin that entangles us and run the race that's been set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, um, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. It's, well, that's um, it's, a, it's a real challenge to, to live in not in the promised land, you know, to live in exile where we, we are the people of God. We have the promises of God. He is faithful. And uh, yet there's that sense of not yet, but it's coming. It's not, it's not yet, but it's coming. Yeah. And, and it prepares us for a completely different word out of the same precious Bible. And that's the epistle lesson for, yeah. this, for this Sunday. And, and you will remember that uh, um, uh, that uh, we have been reading from what is this now the third or the fourth week uh, from Saint Paul's letter to the church at Rome, writing there to prepare for the time when it, he's got his heart set on visiting them. And if you read the Book of Acts, uh, you will remember that. Uh, he had his heart set on getting there. It looked like it was impossible. There were every sort of impediment that could possibly be thrown at him. And this takes uh, some more years, but by God's grace, he does make it to Rome. And this is, in a sense, his preparation, but it's also his prayer for when he will get to meet and sit down with and, and listen and learn and love these brothers and sisters in the emerging Roman Christianity, the emerging Roman churches. So then, brothers, we are debtors. That is, we owe something simply because we're alive. We owe to those who are around us, to this world in which we're living, we owe a debt because we are God's kids in the midst of this world. And so even as God pours out upon us his grace, so we also take this grace and we repay, if we can, what God has given us to the world. But look at the way St. Paul says it here. So then, my brothers, and we would say, and also my dear sisters, we are debtors, we owe, but not to this old way of life, not to the flesh, not to simply whatever it means to consume life, 
not out of the flesh, but not to live according to the flesh, because if you live according to the flesh, you will die. That, that's an interesting way of putting it, but St. Paul just kind of says it like it is. In the New International Version, they will say, so then, brothers, and you, we are debtors, not to the old sinful way of life. And that's a good way of putting it, too. But the Greek says it so bluntly, as St. Paul writes it out, we are debtors, not to the flesh. But if by the Spirit now, is part of that verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, okay, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And here we are once again, as we have been in this seventh chapter, caught somehow or other between the old way of life, the sinful way of life, the debt to our flesh that our flesh constantly calls us to satisfy, to put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit, you will live. Remember, all the way back to chapter 6, and these flow very easily, but not always very, very, very easily in terms of understanding. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit. And the spirit here is the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. We could easily go to the fourth chapter of Galatians here, too. Um, uh, uh, and probably we don't need to do that today, Stephen, but I would strongly suggest that as you're hearing this or as you're reading this at home, go back to Galatians chapter 4, because there you are going to see words very much like this, which both expand on this and also are a commentary. On, on our baptism, on uh, being adopted, and that's a very interesting and singular word that God uses here through St. Paul, both in Romans and also again in Galatians, that we are adopted as his children. Yeah. And in this adoption that he has given us through our Lord Jesus Christ, we are adopted as his children. And in and because of this adoption that we have and the spirit which indwells us, we cry out, Abba, Father. Abba is an Aramaic term which means father. And we, we don't take this for granted. There is in the Old Testament, uh, God constantly reminding us that he is uh, he is our Father, and yet that word is seldom, if ever, ever used of our relationship to God. Very seldom. Abba, the Hebrew, Father. And so there is, because of our life in Christ, because of the Holy Spirit who indwells us, there is a relationship with the eternal God by which we call him Father. Do we dare to do this? Is that becoming too intimate? Is this somehow or other a bit disrespectful? Do we need more distance? Not in our Lord Jesus Christ and not in the Holy Spirit who indwells us. And so we dare to say, our Father who art in heaven, and who gives us both this permission and gives us this relationship, it is our Lord Jesus Christ. And we dare never take that for granted. I'm picturing my kids. Excuse me, go ahead. I'm picturing my little kids right now. You know, they, they look at me and they say, Daddy, when they want to ask me like if they can watch TV or, you know, get some beef jerky or <laughs> Daddy, Daddy. It's a very endearing uh, uh, form of father, right, Abba? Yeah, yeah. Like, like, and, and the best I can come up with is daddy. You yeah. know, or, or and, and uh, we, <laughs> especially when they were teenagers, 
Um, and my kids would all, always call me dad, or sometimes they'd call me other things. But if they were in trouble, or if they needed something, or if this was a time when we needed this kind of closeness and the precious relationship that we enjoyed, they would say, daddy. And my daughter, who is 47 years old, still does this. When she is on the phone and she says, Daddy, I know this is serious time. <laughs> I call my dad Pastor Pops. He's a pastor. <laughs> pastor <good>. Pops. <laughs> Verse 16. For the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, breathed into us in our baptism, and whom we open our lives to every single moment as we say in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, or if we just breathe these words and this prayer without the whole Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Worth saying here, that as Jesus speaks to us in the New Testament, and as we are learn and are learning, he says we are body and mind and heart and soul and spirit. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are in fact children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of what? Heirs of everything that God has created, everything that he gives to us through his son, Jesus Christ, everything we experience as his kids. We are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, providing we suffer with him. More about that next week, but St. Paul introduces this rather interesting and rather foreboding word and thought, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. There is, in the rel this relationship that God calls us into, there is sacrifice, which on the one hand is all joy, and nobody knows this better or says it better than St. Paul, but he introduces this word here because next week we're going to compare the sufferings of our life in Christ with the glory that shall be revealed. But let's just stick here to stay with providing we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him, with our Lord Jesus Christ, who suffered death on the cross in order that he might know and give to us the glory, the glory of life everlasting and the glory of life everlasting with our heavenly Abba Father. Yeah. I, Jesus said uh, before he went to the cross, uh, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And uh, loneliness is a big problem right now in, yeah. um, you know, in all of our households. You know, it's, our life has been disrupted and we, we can't see the people that we have enjoyed spending a lot of time with in the past. And a lot of people are really struggling with emotions, and um, you know, may may God give us uh, some peace uh, in, the, in knowing that He is with us as a uh, as a father is with his child, and uh, it's a very close relationship, not a far away, distant, uncaring father, but but uh, a daddy, uh, an Abba. And um, we have an inheritance, we have a future, we have a forever. Well, I'm ready to go into the gospel lesson and yeah. say a little bit more about the parables today. Yes, here we are, Matthew 13. And as I'd said in introducing this uh, today, that there's a lot of different kinds of languages uh, in the Holy Scripture. And I'm not just talking about Hebrew and Greek, but the way that God expresses himself in his prophets, in his, uh, how would you say it, um, probably church fathers a long way off, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, but all the ways that God expresses himself to us to touch us in, in our hearts, in our spirits, in our bodies, and in our minds. 
Uh, and now we're into another way that Jesus says this. And um, uh, we're, we're going to stand up for this, right? No, we're going to stay seated, but we're standing <laughs> up for the gospel. And um, the parables, there are about 30 parables in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John does not use parables. He used other beautiful and powerful uh, figures of speech. Uh, but uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke love the parable. And I want to read just two things. Uh, that, that kind of, how would you say it? They're like bookends. The, 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 the poem, uh, psalm for Sunday should be, I think it's Psalm 119, part of it, but the psalm should be, Psalm 78, except Psalm 78 is one of the longest psalms, but this is the way it starts. Psalm 78. My people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. With open, uh, and my mouth will open, and I will open my mouth in, and the word that is translated there from the Hebrew is in parables. Let me read that once more. My people hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth, for I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things, things from of old. What we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us, we will not hide from our children. We will tell the next generations the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and wonders he has done. And so all the way back to that first verse now, give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables or in a parable. Okay? So this, this word, probably from as early as a thousand years before our Lord actually opens his mouth in parables to speak to our world, this is a, a figure of speech. This is a way of taking something which is familiar, okay, something that we know, and using it to give through our minds, through our emotions, down into our hearts the place of our emotion in our heart and into our spirit. So the parable is designed to surround us, if you will, with the language of God. In this case, with the language of our Lord Jesus Christ. One more, and that is in the 35th, we're not going to be reading that, but in the 35th um, verse of Matthew's gospel, <laughs> and it's really interesting because Matthew makes a, how, a kind of an observation, and he says he taught people in parables, and without parables, he did not teach them. So uh, this is, is a, a powerful teaching device, but one that takes some time both to learn and to deeply appreciate. Other thoughts at all, Stephen? No. <laughs> okay, let's go, let's go on then into the 13th chapter of Matthew's gospel. Again, this is the year of Matthew, you remember, uh, beginning at the first verse. And that same day, Jesus went out of the house and he sat beside the sea. Obviously, this is the Sea of Galilee. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat. There was no place for him to stand up. So he got into a boat, if we can uh, envision this. And the people gathered along the shoreline. And they were able to hear them as uh, the crowd stretched out. And the whole crowd then stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables. And this is the parable, probably, that many of us know well and have heard again and again and already think we know. All right? A sower went out to sow. And the people are attentive. They are listening. 
what is this all about? We're here to learn about so many deep the things theologically we're we're here to get to get healed we're, we're here to to have life opened up to it and he's telling us a story a sower went out to sow and as he sowed some seeds fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil but when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, these little tiny seedlings or plants that are growing up, they began to wither away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. And other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear let him hear. Now, I suspect that many of us, as we hear these first words, a sower went out to sow. I know, I know that story. And I've, I've, I've heard that uh, a number of times. And I know what's going to go on here. And that is that some of the seed is going to fall on rocky ground without much soil. Some seed is going to fall on ground that is going to be surrounded with thorns that are going to grow fast. And so, on the one hand, we know that, but if we could somehow or other, and I, I'm not even sure that's possible, if somehow or other we could move back to that time on the beach, on the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus standing in that boat, what did they hear? We understand that what is being sowed here is the Word of God. What's being sowed here is the promises of God. What's being sowed here is the good news. But what happens, Jesus says, the seed doesn't make it, except for that which fell on good soil and produced grain. Now, what were the people saying? What were they understanding? Is he talking about me? Uh, is somehow or other this, this good soil, is it... Is it my family? Well, at any rate, it does not appear yet that Jesus is explaining this to them. And God bless the disciples. They come and they surround Jesus later on that afternoon or later on this that evening, or as they were eating supper together, they asked the question, I don't. I don't quite understand this. I, 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 what, what? What's? What's going on? And at this point, Jesus um, uh, says to them that. And what he what he says to them? Maybe, maybe we should now. Let's not go all the way back there, Stephen. Um, but if you can get um, and and here is is. Uh, um, let's go. Let's go to um, because this is again so important. Let's go to to Matthew chapter thirteen and right in the middle, right in the middle there, um, uh, and let's go to verse ten. Verse ten. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, again, maybe having supper together, but they're they're talking, and then the disciples came from and said, "Why do you speak to them in parables?" Why do you use this kind, of, this kind of language? And then Jesus said to them, to you, it has been given to know, that's a special word, not simply to know with your head, not simply to understand, but also to know deep down into your heart and into your soul, your spirit. It has been given to you to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Ah, ah. There is everybody who surrounded him that day on the shore. Each of them have a hope for, and they're excited by the possibility of the kingdom of God. Or here, as Matthew always says it, or renders it, the kingdom of heaven. There is, these are kingdom parables. 
uh, they and they are they are saying something and symbolizing something. Although these people on the shore that day may or may not have known it, but the disciples understand that when Jesus heals, okay, it is not simply a miracle. It is a sign that the kingdom is present. The good news is that the good news is preached to the poor. And even more immediate and dramatic than that, the lepers are healed, and the lame are raised, and the deaf can hear, and the blind speak. These are the signs of the kingdom. When Jesus reaches out and touches and transforms people life, people's lives, whatever hurts or ails them, uh, this is a sign that the kingdom is present. We may not know all the things that the kingdom is, but we do know the kingdom is here. So again, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. God is in his mission, saving people in this place and through this moment and in the life of this Messiah, this Messiah. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not yet been given. And I say yet advisedly, that's my own insertion, because what I do know at this point, or think I know at this point, is that the people are going home, scratching their heads, are saying to each other, do you understand exactly what this Jesus of Nazareth is saying? And the other may say, I'm not sure, but my guess might be, at any rate, there is still that that revelation that must be given about this parable. Verse 12, then, Jesus is about to reveal. But first he says, For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. We could well spend some time on that, but I want to get just a little bit further. This is why I speak to them in parables. Now, between now when you and now when you hear this Sunday morning, you're going to have a chance to spend some time praying about it, thinking about it. Maybe you have commentaries, and maybe you can take at the bottom of those commentaries or those Bibles that you have to say, what do these parables mean? At any rate, verse 13, Jesus says, this is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. It is one thing, one thing to have the word in our mind. It is quite another to have processed that word and now begin to live with it and live upon it. Verse 14, indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. This is the word that God speaks to Isaiah in his call, Isaiah chapter 6. For this is the context, you remember, where finally Isaiah says, Here I am, send me, send me. And in that case, God says, Okay, this is your task. You will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see but you will never perceive. This is the hard hearts and the closed minds of the people to whom Isaiah will speak. God says, for this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they hear, they can barely hear, and in their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart. Ah, and that's where all this is heading and understand with their heart. It goes deeper than simply the superficiality of ears and eyes. It goes all the way down. And that's what Jesus is speaking. And then they will turn and I will heal them. All of this preparation. But now verse 16. But blessed are your eyes, Jesus says to his disciples, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. And yet the disciples don't get it. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see 
and did not see it, and to hear what you are now hearing, and they did not hear it. In another context, Jesus says, great kings and the great wise people of the earth and certainly of Israel, they have longed to hear and see what you hear and see, but it was never revealed to them now. So Jesus, the parable of the sower is explained. Yeah, and let's go up. We just stick right here and just go on up because this is the last part of this gospel lesson for this day. Here then, the parable of the sower and the disciples at this point are all ears and eyes and we hope open heart, right? When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, this is a kingdom parable, as are all the parables, whether they are named as kingdom parables or are simply parables without identifying them as kingdom parables. Each of these is exposing something of the kingdom which is present. You remember John the Baptist? He says that repent for the kingdom of God is here. And Jesus' first words in both kingdom or, or public words in both Matthew and in Mark, repent for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is here. So again, verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the evil one, comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. And this is not simply so much living. There is the presence of Satan who would steal that kingdom word from us and lead us to believe that our lives each day in the secular world uh, doesn't make much difference. All of it, all of it. Verse 20, as for what is sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself. There's nothing, <laughs> how do you say it? Well, I said a couple of weeks ago, I think that, that uh, David Brooks, the author of The Second Mountain, said that so much of his life um, was um, it was rocky ground, or it was, um, he, 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 taught, he said it about it, but it had no root. And yet he has no root in himself, but it endures for a while, this word does, or this seed does. And tribulations or persecutions arise on account of the word, immediately he falls away. And this is what, again, uh, David Brooks said in his second mountain is that he in that second mountain begins to, if you will, not simply with his mind understand, but with his heart and now with his soul, with his inmost being, he opens up his life and long for what God would give him and wonder of wonders and to his eternal joy, he begins to see and hear what his life ought to be about in the midst of this secular world. And all of a sudden, his life begins to open up to the things that are spiritual and to the things that feed his soul. As he says, he discovers his soul. Again, then, verse 21, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and if tribunals or persecution arises out of account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it again proves unfruitful. And finally, verse 23. As for what was sown on good soil, you want to move it up there a little bit, Stephen? Yeah, yeah. As for what was sown on good soil, this indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another 60, and in another 30. Now, if you're sitting in that small crowd that's much smaller crowd now whether it's just the 12 or whether there are some others who are there we're not quite sure but in that smaller crowd 
And as Jesus explains it, what are they saying to each other? What are they thinking? This is a kingdom parable. It's giving us some insight into another level of life, into a new dimension of personal responsibility, of the possibility that I might learn not simply not simply by religious habit, not simply by going to temple or to the synagogue, but that there is a, a reality, there is a dimension, there is something that this, that this man, this Messiah, this, this, this precious, precious person on whose words I, I, I just take all, there is more to life in the, than I can see. And what he's doing is in a way kind of teasing me a little bit, mm -hmm. saying, are you ready to go just a little bit deeper into your life? For your life is not simply about eating and drinking and growing up and having kids and then dying. There's something more here. Are you ready for it? Listen to the parable. Listen to the possibility. Listen to what I am saying. And there is no question that Jesus is doing more than teaching, but he is, if you will, in this parable, he's beginning to plow the earth. He's beginning to go deeper into the lives of these people. They are opening themselves up, if you will say, or he is opening them up, their ears and their eyes to be sure by what he's doing, by healing and holding the people around him, by these kingdom signs that said the poor now have, and I certainly qualify, they say, the poor <laughs> had the gospel preached to them, and now there is this, this, how would you say, the plowing of the earth is the way I would like, there is this opening up, not simply of ears and eyes which are entertained and then they're gone, but there's something going deeper into the heart and into the soul. So the parables, pay attention to them, for you are being taught by God as he gives you these pictures and you begin to open up your life and your heart and your soul to the much, much deeper hearing. Stephen? Well, and it's, you know, it's tempting to start to, your question, well, like, how do I, how do I become good soil? And I think that it's the, the blossoming that happens when the seed grows. And, you know, that, that last line, he indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, another 60, another 30. Uh, it's, you know, with, it's with anticipation, great anticipation that we, we listen to the word of God, whether it's read or preached, or we, we open up the Bible ourselves and, and read it. Or we sit at the feet of Jesus uh, to, to contemplate him as we, we know him from scriptures and what he's taught. Um, we expect him to work his good. And, and I think uh, that's very empowering, you know, as, as we really are searching for something that would, uh, would work healing and hope and a, a sense of, of purpose in a world that seems to be trying to, to rob those things from us. You know, a lot of people can't really right now explain um, what they're going through, what they're feeling. I, I know that there is uh, circumstances in, during the time of Jesus' ministry where there's a lot of unrest as far as Romans rule and the, the divide between the, the religious elite and it seems like the, the masses of people that were clamoring. You know, a few weeks ago, there was that observation that Jesus made that the crowds of people were like, those who had no shepherd, sheep who had no shepherd, they were longing for someone to to guide and to bring clarity. And uh, there's there's a lot of that happening right now in all of our minds and hearts as the world is very different and unexpected. Um, 
there's a lot of memes, a lot of jokes about the year 2020 and what it's doing. <laughs> it's, it's not letting up. So what's this new month going to offer, you know, that we didn't, would never have expected. Um, but we can certainly open up God's scriptures. We can, we can listen to the voice of Jesus. We can consider his works, his ways, and, um, and know that, that he has a lot to offer us and, you know, to, the, to the core of who we are. Um, and and I, I, I've experienced that myself where I'm feeling the funk of life and um, I have to put the social media away, turn the news off and turn the audio book, the Bible, <laughs> turn that on and uh, listen to these passages. That, uh, yesterday morning, uh, beginning my week thinking about these assigned lessons uh, knowing that one of the passages was from Isaiah, I, I thought, you know, I'm going to, uh, I have my coffee, it's early in the morning, and I feel really, really tired. I'm just going to lie here on the couch in physical and mental misery, <laughs> and I'm going to let, let the word of Isaiah play on this audio book, this audio Bible. And, um, and wow, there's so... that. The beginning in chapter 40, especially, there's so much promise, so much gospel, so much good news that it really it hit my ears and it did something in my heart that only God really knows, but I was refreshed. And these parables, these words of Jesus, uh, they, they're here for us to, to listen. If we can't read it ourselves because we're just, we're not people who read, you know, we have audio Bibles and we have uh, people in our family who can can read to us. You know, right now, if you go to the hospital, it's really we're limited in who can be there with us in the same room. And so uh, apps that have audio Bibles can be of great help. Uh, I know some parents can be with children in the hospital. There's There's provision for that. And so you can sit there and you can read the parables to your kids. You can read the words of Jesus to your kids and know that... Uh, that that seed, it's the power of God. And I, maybe we could obsess about the other types of soil or the choking of the world. But I think that, you know, those circumstances are going to be what they are. But if, we, if we're going to apply our minds to anything, just to, to quiet our hearts and, um, and open our ears to hear the word of the Lord, and the word of Jesus, and, um, and let God do his work. Well, we've introduced the parables uh, a little bit, and we've got another uh, set of parables coming up for the for the weeks to follow. But now, just just this is uh, on the one hand kind of silly, but at the same time, I think about things like this as they reflect on the Word of God, and the Word of God reflects on. The, there was a very uh, um, very 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 popular comedy group uh, starting in Britain by finding their way to the United States a few years ago by the name of Monty Python. Uh, and and they they were so silly, but at the same time, there was often um, a rather significant meaning to their silliness. And there was a one of the movies they made, which was an eminently forgettable and probably not necessary movie, by the name of The Life of Brian. And in that movie, it was again a kind of a parable, if you will, alongside, uh, as they perceived it, the life of our Lord. In this case, it was Brian. And there's a scene in that movie, and there are many of them, not all of them either memorable or probably should have been photographed, but there's one scene there I'll never forget. And this Brian uh, uh, is, is out in the crowd, and he's listening to, in this case, it's Jesus. Um, in, the, in that first century setting, and the crowds are all around, and they're jostling each other and trying to get close enough to hear and so on. And finally, Jesus says, out of the Sermon on the Mount, they hear Jesus saying, blessed are the peacemakers, okay, for they shall become the children, the sons and daughters of God. And the one jostles the other, he said, what did he say? Blessed are what? And the response is, I think he said, blessed are the cheesemakers, uh, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. 
He said, that makes no sense whatsoever. Blessed are the cheesemakers. What is so bloody special about the cheesemakers? <laughs> and that's, that's the way the conversation go. But I'm, I'm, what, I, what I was thinking then, that I've thought and chuckled about from time to time, I just wonder in these large crowds, and also the crowds of today, Pastor Stephen, that we don't hear what Jesus is saying, and, yeah. and we walk away, um, uh, and it never gets beyond our ears and our eyes. It never sinks into our heart, because we believe and we live in such a way that our Christianity is pretty superficial, and it never gets much beyond a Sunday noon. Yeah. And these are times, I these are times, I believe, when God calls us just to shut up and listen yeah. because he loves us so much. These are times when we can open up our souls, which we have not had opened up because we're so busy with the world, and we can open up our minds, and we can open up our hearts. Yeah. Okay, and that's what Jesus is up to, and what the parables are up to, and so this can be, for all of its challenges, a terribly, deeply blessed time, as the Word gets into us deeper and deeper, and we learn that it's not about the cheesemakers, it's about the people. <laughs> Well, this month, July, um, we have uh, three Sundays with three different parables. And then in August, we'll have some miracles. And um, it really can be a, a good conversation starter. But to add that opportunity, uh, we're, we're going to be sending out an email, try to post some things on our website related to what we're, uh, we want to encouraged for the sake of our children and families where our households have become the center of our Christian discipleship right now, especially. Um, we, we have some books from Concordia Publishing House, a collection of parables, beautifully, beautifully illustrated and poetically rendered with, with some explanations of, you know, the, the message behind them. Uh, we want to get those to uh, to you and uh, have some videos available with the with the prayer that moms and children, dads and children, grandmas and grandpas and their grandkids could sit down with these parables and um, and look at God's word. And I, it's such an awesome thing when a child listens to what you know Jesus is saying. And just be ready for the most insightful interpretations of God's word as your, your children and grandchildren echo or ask questions. It's really a, a sweet thing. And I, I want you guys to give yourself the gift of that, to uh, open up these children's books uh, on the parables. And um, there's, a, I think, four, five or six parables in the first book. And then we're going to move on to a, another book that's a collection of uh, some, uh, some great children's stories about the miracles of Jesus. So that's uh, the first thing that we're doing um, right now, moving forward uh, with children's ministry, hoping to enrich our, our home life, uh, get moms and pa well, parents and kids, grandparents and kids talking about Jesus. Well, and, and you showed me that that little video clip you got of Krisha, uh, your wife. I'm so proud of it. Well, and and so I'm, I'm sure maybe we need to close this time because I just I just love her introduction to a parable or to the parable. So all right, so this will be an official sneak peek at the end yeah. of this. If yeah. if uh, someone mentions this, we'll will know that they actually watched our whole Bible study. This will be our test. All right, let me share the screen. This is my wife, my lovely lady. Here we are. Hi, everybody. I'm Krisha from Zion. Today, I want to teach you a song that goes along with the story in this book of parables from Jesus. 
In this book, on page seven, you can find the story of the wise and the foolish builders. If you haven't read it yet, in a little bit, you can grab your book and your favorite adult or read it on your own. Um, but I wanna teach you this song. Feel free to do the actions and sing along as you learn it and repeat it as many times as you'd like. It goes like this. The wise man built his house upon a rock. The wise man built his house upon a rock. The wise man built his house upon a rock and the rains came a tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up and the house on the rock stood strong. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand and the rains came a tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up and the house on the sand went splat. So build your life on the word of the Lord. So build your life on the word of the Lord. So build your life on the word of the Lord. Cause a life on God's word will stand strong. Have fun learning that song. And remember, if you haven't read this story yet, grab your book and read the story of the wise and the foolish builders. Have a great day. We and this is the gospel of the Lord. <laughs> Praise be to God. <laughs> all right. Blessings to you all. Have an awesome week. Thank you, Howard.